I want you to think about what you can do if you're getting on an elevator. You can decide a couple of things. So you can walk onto the elevator and decide to go up or down, right? But you can also decide to walk onto the elevator, realize you forgot something, and run straight back out as well. Now, if you can get that analogy, you can understand spinal cord physiology. Hey everybody, Organized Biology here. We're talking about reflexes and physiology of the spinal cord. So what you need to know first is that the spinal cord is going to be a mediator between what's called the peripheral nervous system and the brain or the, in the central nervous system. Now the peripheral nervous system deals with two major functions. One is we can detect sensory information, put it into the spinal cord, and then send it up to the brain. So once again, this is sensory information. So that is like you're entering into the elevator, the spinal cord, and going up, 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 up to the brain to detect that sensation. Interesting. But at the same time, if you want to move a muscle per se, we need that information to originate in the brain. In that case, we go down from the brain and then out through spinal nerve, and that will be motor output. Okay, so that's how the spinal cord is kind of an elevator if we're going in and up, sensory, down and out, motor. But we can also go in and directly out. If we have sensory information coming in and go directly out, that is actually called a reflex arc. A reflex arc where you're basically doing something automatically. We've all been to the doctor, they tap our knee and our knee kicks out reflexively. That is a reflex coordinated by the spinal cord. But how does that all work? Well, in order to do that, we need to know how the spinal cord works in a cross section. So what I've done is I've cut the spinal cord in half, peaked inside, we've got front side and back side. And we're gonna look at how this sensory and motor information kind of go in and out so we can understand how the spinal cord works. But before we do that, I want you to first like and subscribe, but then secondly, know that we have these nerves here that run along the spinal cord in pairs all the way down to about lumbar two, and then it extends through what's called the cauda equina, which is basically the horse's tail of several different spinal nerves that will go down to L4, 5, the sacral nerves, and then the coccygeal nerve. And they're all in pairs. And all I would like you to know about those nerves is that they will detect and send motor output to the structures that are nearby them. So for example, let's say we're talking about the cervical two nerve, right? That's going to control some muscles in the neck and detect things from the neck. Let's say it's like lumbar three. Well, that's going to control more lower leg potentially and detecting things from the lower leg as well. So just know, depending on the level of the elevator, that's going to control a different structure around that same region. Makes sense, right? So we're just going to say <clears throat> any general part of the spinal cord, we cut it in half and it will look like this. Now, if you watch the spinal cord anatomy video, I'll link it uh, right here. Uh, but if you haven't watched that, please do. I'm going to reference some terms that I'm going to mention in this video. So we look inside the spinal cord and we see two main sections. We see this intersection that would actually be colored in all the way throughout because that's the gray matter. So I'm just gonna write gray here, actually up a little higher. So gray matter here. And then all the spots around it will all be white matter. So I'll just write white here. So we know gray matter is uh, basically consists of a lot of interneurons. They're kind of talking back and forth. And then white matter is gonna be these long tracts, long tracts where we're going up or down the spinal cord. So let's just take an example of, say, we feel something in the skin. So here's going to be the skin right here, okay? And we have things called free nerve endings in the skin that will detect different stimuli in that epidermal and dermal layer. So these are actually, we can label them as dendrites, the detecting parts of the neurons. And when they detect some sort of stimulus like pressure, all of that will be sent back eventually through the spinal nerve. Okay, so it's like we're detecting things out here, sending it through the spinal nerve, and it actually goes through the dorsal root on this side. From here, we continue to send the action potential all the way to the axon of the spinal nerve that will conclude in this dorsal horn of the gray matter. Okay, now I see the signaling branch, the axon here. So the axon is sending its action potential that direction, right, towards the spinal cord. We know it's sensory information. But where's the cell body, right? We have cell bodies and neurons. Well, this is a pseudo unipolar neuron where we've got the neuron cell body here, dendrite over here, and then axon over here. 
And this structure where all of the sensory neuron cell bodies will be located is called the dorsal root ganglia. Dorsal root ganglia, dorsal root of the spinal cord, ganglia meaning a collection of cell bodies. Wonderful. Now, we put it into the spinal cord, and I have a question for you. Do you feel it once this signal gets to the spinal cord? Do you like consciously perceive that? Actually not, because we perceive things in our brains, right? So we need to send this sensory information up to the brain so that it can process it and determine what that sensation is. So what's really interesting is in the gray matter here, there will be what's called an interneuron. So this will be an interneuron, literally translates to between neurons. Okay, it's going to receive information from this sensory neuron. I'll label this guy as well, sensory neuron. And it will stimulate interneuron to basically get excited to send its action potential. But what's fascinating, what's fascinating about this is the interneuron's axon actually crosses over all the way through here behind the gray matter and up this direction if it's dealing with the sensation of touch. Now what's interesting is there's also different uh, sensations that can travel up different tracks of the white column, but all of these you notice are going to be going up on the opposite side. Okay, you see that? So detected, we're going to say this is the left side of the body, this side is the right side of the body. Detecting sensations here, interneuron crosses over with its axon and starts traveling up in the white matter. Couple things here. Once we travel up, we're going to process this on the left side, or sorry, the right side, right? The right side of the brain. This is the reason why the right side of the brain perceives the left side of the body. Isn't that fascinating, okay? Now, I wanna give a couple more clarifications here. When we send that information up to this region of the brain, it's actually going to stop first in this region called the thalamus. The thalamus is going to be the sorting center of all sensory information. So I'm going to write sorting center. And then it will be sent up to something called the somatosensory cortex. We'll label that, but that's where we're actually going to process that sensation from our skin. Fascinating. So that's one thing I wanted to point out. The second thing I wanted to point out is it's traveling through the white matter, correct? We know white matter consists of myelinated axons, basically insulated axons, that allow things to travel very, very quickly. I'm just gonna say very fast. Because when we enter the spinal cord with some sort of sensation, we wanna tell the brain immediately. And that's why these are myelinated. Very cool. Now you may say, well, Mr. J, that's sensory information, but how do I move a muscle, right? That's motor output. Glad you asked, person who I don't know who asked the question. Uh, well, we're gonna do motor output in blue. So I'm going to kind of draw this. I don't really have a lot of space here. But we're going to draw another neuron in the brain. Maybe I can just redraw it down here. I'll just redraw it down here. Here we got the brain. And we're going to originate any sort of voluntary motor output on the, it's called the, uh, oh man, I'm forgetting already. It's the precentral gyrus. That's one <laughs> name of it. Uh, primary motor cortex. There we go. Primary motor, motor cortex neuron will actually travel, again, from the right side and then cross over, go down and then exit out the left side of the body. So how does that look on our diagram here? This is a cross section, right? Well, we know this upper motor neuron is traveling down, 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 but it's gonna cross over way up here in the medulla oblongata. From there, it's going to travel down and eventually come to about right here where we will have our lower motor neuron. That's this guy that I drew right here. So I'm just gonna label this two. This is number two. This is number one. This was number one. So we're eventually going to have this lower motor neuron in the ventral horn of the gray matter travel out the ventral root of the spinal nerve, and it's going to come and talk to, we'll say in this example, skeletal muscle fibers. Skeletal muscle fibers, we'll draw it like this, multinucleated, and it's a skeletal muscle, and it will stimulate it to contract, okay? So that's how motor output works. We come down from the brain, cross over, go to the lower motor neuron. Lower motor neuron then synapses, communicates with skeletal muscle, and it's triggered to contract. Isn't that fascinating? Okay, so that's how we have voluntary motor output for skeletal muscle. 
we got sensory information in, and once again, they both cross over. So we could say the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, and the same is true on both sides. Awesome. However, that just addressed, hey, we're coming in the elevator and up. We're going down the elevator and out. But what about when we go in the elevator and then we immediately turn back out? That is called a reflex. So we're gonna draw the reflex over here. So let's say, for example, um, we've got a patellar tendon reflex we're gonna do. So here's gonna be like your knee. So we're just drawing your knee. It's gonna be a very terrible picture of a knee. Here's your knee, here's your kneecap. And we're gonna say we're gonna have that stimulus of the hammer going right there. So hammer. I can spell hammer, and it's going to trigger sensory neurons. They're called, uh, I believe, stretch receptors or spindle fibers, and they're going to be right here detecting stretch in the tendon. When that occurs, we're going to, again, send that action potential all the way into dorsal root into gray matter, right? So there's that neuron in the dorsal root ganglia on the other side. So we now detected that basically tap, okay? And as always, what will happen? Well, we know there will be an interneuron here. And based on what we learned here, what do you think is going to happen? Well, obviously, that guy is going to travel over and go up, okay? And eventually, I kind of draw that here, travel up here, go up to the brain to get processed. But we're worried about a reflex now, right? Because hammer taps it, it's telling us that our muscles and tendons are stretching too much, so we need to contract those back to protect ourselves, okay? So we don't want the tendon to stretch too much, so we need to reflexively contract it back immediately. Why do we want to do it immediately? Well, because if we go up to the brain, then the brain has to figure out, oh, I need to contract back. Then it's going to signal, send the signal all the way back down and out. It just takes too long. So the spinal cord is smart. It says, hey, instead of waiting for the brain to designate this response, let's just go immediately out. So here's what's going to happen. That interneuron is going to create a reflex arc and synapse directly with a lower motor neuron. Come on out, the lower motor neuron does, and it's going to talk to skeletal muscles. We'll come right here, specifically in the thigh. So here we'll have some skeletal muscles in the thigh, and that reflex will trigger this guy to contract immediately. When that guy contracts, there's your reflex. So all we needed was sensory neuron in, interneuron to motor neuron, motor neuron out. That is called a reflex arc, a reflex arc. Now question. What type of neuron is this? If you've learned about my organization of nervous system, you should know that this guy is called a somatic motor neuron because somatic motor neurons control skeletal muscles. So this is another skeletal muscle, right? But here's the thing. We know that somatic motor neurons are voluntary. We can control them, correct? In fact, I just demonstrated how we can voluntarily control this guy, right? with that upper motor neuron talking to lower motor neuron. Was this voluntarily controlled? In this case, it was not because it was a reflex. But what's interesting is we would also have a neuron in the upper part of the brain that can directly talk to this guy as well. So in a way, this neuron has kind of two inputs. It can have one from the brain, and that would be the voluntary input. And it can have one in the case of a reflex, where it's basically from an interneuron, from the sensory neuron, and that will be reflex. So now you can't control it in that circumstance. It's really fascinating. So don't just remember somatic motor neurons are always voluntary. No, they can be triggered by a reflex or voluntarily from your brain. So that's spinal cord physiology and reflexes. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments.